Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Want bees to visit your garden? Why not just invite them to stay by getting a beehive? Today we're going to take a look at beekeeping. Also, wildflowers are beautiful and can attract bees, butterflies, and even hummingbirds into your garden. That's just ahead in the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is David Glover. David is the Bartley Bee Whisperer, and Andy Williams from Lichterman Nature Center will be joining us later to talk about wildflowers. All right, Mr. David. Hey. We're back. Get up to them, huh? This is a little different. The bee suits. In bee suits. Right. We're actually in bees. A um, couple of things, real quickly, okay. before we even start. Uh, one thing that is really hard for new beekeepers is keeping their smoker lit. Okay. Now, why do you need a smoker? To alert the bees. No. Alert. Not well, alert. Well, kind of. You may okay. want to think about it. Most people think smoke is a calming effect on okay. bees. It doesn't. It actually confuses their ability to talk to each other. All the kids know about the waggle dance and how bees tell other bees about where flowers are, but bees really communicate with pheromones. Those are smells that mean something. Well, we generally can't smell what the bees are saying, so what we can smell is smoke. Okay. Smoke is louder than anything the bees can say, and the first thing that we do when we get into the bees is we smoke them a little bit. That yeah. smoke confuses their ability to talk to each other. The guard bees can't tell the other bees that we're in them, and some of the bees will actually take that smoke and realize there's a fire somewhere. Okay. And they'll go into the hive and suck up as much honey as they can. It distends their abdomens. And bees have to extend their stinger to sting. Uh -huh. When their bellies are full, they can't they push can't out their that. stinger. Okay. So they're confused and they can't sting us. The smoker is very important and keeping it lit while you're working is even more important because once the bees are looking at us, that means they know we're here. Okay. There's a little bit of smoke across the top of them and they go back to doing what they were doing. Well, let's make sure we keep that smoker on, man. So we smoked let's them in the front. That. We've waited about 60 seconds. We're gonna lift the back. All right. Put a little smoke under here. Okay. And the reason we're opening this hive is because I just got these bees from somebody's house last week. Okay. And we wanna see how they're progressing. One thing that we look at as the bees come and go from the entrance, you can learn a lot about what's going on with the bees. If they have pollen on their legs, that means they have babies. If they have babies, that means they probably have a laying queen. Okay. Pollen is protein. Everything needs protein to grow. Okay. Okay. So we watch that. We watch the activity. Is there any arguing going on in front? Is anybody fighting? <laughs> Bees defend their hive. Okay. If there's no hive movement up front, no arguing, then they're not stressed. Well, there's some bees. Well, how about that? And this is a hive tool neat factors on this is you can use this to break apart pieces of wood that the bees have glued together. together. Okay. Hear that popping? Yeah, I heard it. Okay. Now how would you think the bees are doing? Right now we've got bees, so okay. they're alive. So they're alive, okay. And see how they're looking up at us? See uh -huh. the eyes? I see that. Just a little bit of smoke. And down they go. Wow, they went straight down. Okay. When we open a hive, Man. we start on the outside and work in. Okay. Now this is a new hive. I'm not expecting much movement in here, but this is what we would do. Pry the bar apart. This goes right here and oh, jacks up man. the side of the frame. Not expecting anything on this frame because it's brand new. Okay. Slide this frame over and keep sliding over to see what the bees are doing. So as you're sliding those over though, but that's not bothering the bees. No, because they're doing their thing. Okay. Okay. Right. Lift this up. See okay. the glistening in there? I see it. That's nectar. Neat. That's going to be honey. Neat. Nectar comes from flowers. And it's the liquid source in the flower that draws the bees in. Okay. As the bees are digging around getting nectar, the pollen in the flower is actually getting stuck to the little hairs on their bodies. And when they leave that flower and go to the next flower, that causes pollination. The okay. pollen transfers. That causes our fruits and our vegetables to grow. Now, 
See this real fat bee right here? I see it. That's a drone. That's okay. a boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good if size. If you look too. at him, yeah. see how big his eyes are? I see that. His whole head is just about all eyes. He's got one purpose in life, and that's to find a new queen and mate with her. So he needs all those eyes to see her. How about that? He sits in the hive all day long until about two o'clock in the afternoon, sucking up honey. Wow. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, all the drones leave the hive and they go to a place called a drone congregation hour area, a DCA. <laughs> DCA. <laughs> it's sort of like a smoker lounge for bees. <laughs> and they kind of hang out and wait for a new queen to come. Now, how does she find them? There's not a big neon sign up there, but there's pheromones a trail of pheromones where the boys have flown and she follows straight to them. And when she shows wow. up, game is on. Wow. Huh. They will chase her. That's and the first 12 to 20 drones that catch up with her will mate with her. And she stores up all of that genetic material inside her body in a very special organ called a spermatotheca. And coming from her intestines is a tube that feeds sugar to them. Okay. And it keeps those sperm viable for up to five years. Whoa. Crazy. Man, that is wild. One mating, and that's it for her. Wow. That's so it. That's, that's it for, we're going to go one more box down. That's it for her. She never leaves the hive again unless the hive feels constricted or congested. And she will leave with half the colony and go find a new home. Okay. That's what happens in the spring and summer. It's called swarming. Okay. They're looking for a new home. So it'll be a big cluster of bees hanging on a tree or a mailbox or somebody's car. They don't have anything to defend, so they're not going to get, they're not going to sting you unless you go mess with them. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, even here, bees are defensive. They're only going to defend their hive and their honey. They're not going to come look at you like wasps or yellow jackets will. Yes. Okay. I've been a witness to that one. We're going to go down one more box. This box is the box of frames and comb that we got from the house. A lot more action in here. When we take comb out of a house, we got to do something with it. Rubber bands hold it in place. So everyone that has the X on it is a rubber banded comb. Okay. These on the outside are just fillers that we put in so that they have everything they need to grow. Ah. Plastic foundation. Bees build wax on top of this. They build it out. How neat is that? They'll do it on both Man. sides. We'll set that right here. Go over one more. And then that looks good. That's a lot of bees down in there. That's also a lot of honey. Wow. Huh. See the white caps? I do. That white is honey. Okay. Earlier we had liquid. Once it gets to about 17% moisture, once the bees have dried it out, they cap it over with wax. Wow. And that's their honey. And again, Impressive. two fat drones. I see them. A lot of workers. In a hive of 40,000 bees, you may have a thousand boys. A thousand. How long before the bees can make honey, though? Well, almost immediately. Okay. When they set up a new hive, there, there are bees that are building wax and bees that are going to the field. And they're bringing food in as fast as they can. So this is comb that was in somebody's house. Wow. See the tan pockets? Uh -huh. Those are babies. Those are brood Okay. that are just about to hatch. They go through the same four metamorphic stages that butterflies go through. Egg, larva, uh -huh. pupa, pupa, adult. adult. Right. They actually spin a cocoon inside the wax. And that's the cap over the cocoon. Wow. But this was in somebody's house last week. And they'll eventually fill this whole area out with wax. And once they do, then we won't have to worry about these spare pieces sticking off the side. I'll set that there. That is so impressive. Now, David, before we have to leave, mm -hmm. I noticed there are a few dead bees lying on the ground. Yes. Uh, new beekeepers may look at that and go, oh my gosh, somebody sprayed my bees. Or they've gotten into a pesticide. Bees work themselves to death. Okay. And sometimes they'll die inside the hive. And when they do, another bee will carry that dead bee outside the hive and drop it on the ground. Well, the entrance is right here, so there are a few dead bees on the ground. Okay. What I'm looking for right now is evidence that the queen is laying. We're looking for eggs and larvae. 
right here is the queen. Huh. Right here, going down. Going down, I see her. It doesn't take long for her to lay an egg. The queen lays about 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. Literally, her body weight every day in eggs. How impressive is that? Mr. David, we appreciate this. This has been outstanding. In fact, it's been- Outstanding in the field. Unbelievable, <laughs> how about that? Thank yes. you much. You're very welcome, thank y'all. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Andy, let's talk a little bit about wildflowers. Oh, great, it's one of my favorite things. I, I, I could tell, <laughs> I see you brought us some here to look at today. Yeah, I, I did, uh, and also wanted to talk about them a bit. Sure. You know, uh, at Lakeford Nature Center, our mission focuses on interpretation of native wildlife. Okay. And we do a lot of interpretation on butterflies, particularly monarchs, and I think every garden should have some uh, milkweed in it. Nice. But, but yeah. you know, we cover that all the time. So today I wanted to talk to you about uh, uh, sturdy, reliable plants for our area okay. uh, that are good for the garden, uh, for the birds, the bees, and just mm -hmm. for their beauty. Okay. So uh, these so are native? These are native plants. Mm -hmm. Native plants are plants that were, well, there's a million different definitions. <laughs> and, and I'm you, sure. And you really can get stuck in the mud if you just, uh, you know, find, you know, just fight over it. But most people say plants that were here before European colonization. Okay, I've heard that. Okay. But, you know, some have naturalized, you know, Queen Anne's lace and mm -hmm, that sort of mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, a lot of native plants, um, not, I mean, a lot of native insects only eat, and by eat, I mean uh, talk about eating the leaves okay. of native plants. So they're uh, very important in the environment for uh, bugs and such. Uh, also, well, a lot of like hummingbirds and bees and butterflies will uh, get nectar from almost any plant, right. anything that's blooming, and all that sort of stuff. But if you want to have uh, butterflies and even beetles, that's uh, all important for biodiversity, you really need a, a variety of uh, different native plants. Okay. Unfortunately, native plants have been oversold. Just because you, uh, you know, they grow in this area doesn't mean they may or may not be a good choice for your backyard. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, you know, some plants are easier to grow than others, and so I want to talk about three of my favorite plants okay. in regards to uh, how to grow them, how to grow them with uh, minimal muss and fuss, and how to grow more of them. Okay. So uh, the first uh, plant I uh, want to talk about uh, blooms in early spring. You know, uh, uh, there are uh, variations every season. Some things bloom early, middle, and late. And the plants we're going to talk about always bloom in the same sequence, but if we have an early spring, they may bloom early, earlier than, than later times. Okay. But it's one of my favorites it's called Baptisia. Right. Well, I call it Baptisia. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the common name, although that's not that common, is uh, false wild blue indigo. Okay. Indigo was a plant they used for dye to uh, dye blue jeans and such. Yes. Uh, it's a legume. I mean, it's part of the uh, 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 pea family. Right. <laughs> uh, they have remarkable seed pods. They do. That's impressive. Uh, they're green now. Uh, they'll eventually turn black if the, they last long enough for the birds to eat them. If you uh, open them up, and I don't know if they can see that on camera, but you can see all little baby peas. And as the season goes on and they mature, they'll be almost as, as big as English peas as you get at the grocery store. Wow. I don't know if they're edible, but they're really pretty that way. But uh, if you don't want them to reseed, which they will, okay. uh, you can simply uh, uh, clip the, uh, uh, the, the seeds off. Baptisia also has a real pretty color. It's kind of a blue green. Yeah, I like it. Um, I like it. And if you grow it in full sun, it's a sturdy plant and doesn't need staking. But if you uh, cut it back by a third after it blooms, and you'll probably get a lot of these off if you cut off by a third, it makes a nice round a blue green shrub that stands up without staking the entire season. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I say, you know, after it blooms and such, uh, but uh, you can uh, uh, cut this back. It makes a nice shrub, so it gives you early spring pretty blue blooms. Uh, later on, uh, you'll have the seed, green seed pods that'll turn to black, and you'll have a blue green shrub. Uh, right now in Memphis, there's another form of Baptisia. It's another species, Baptisia alba, that's white indigo. Okay. It's not quite as bushy, but it has spectacular tall white blooms. Uh, the second one, is, uh, this one is blooming right now, and who, what's not to like about this, but uh, purple coneflower. 
Yeah, so, that's beautiful. Yeah, uh, the, the, the scientific name is Echinacea uh, uh, purpurea. And what's not to like about it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just it's just beautiful. It's got you know purple leaves, uh, uh, yellow seed head that turns black. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, parts of the plants are, are have medicinal uses. In fact, you go to the health food store, uh, you can buy all sorts of echinacea type supplements. I believe they're good for colds and other things. People ask me, well, how can I grow enough uh, of this plant uh, for herbal use? And say, well, you have to have a field. You know, if you're looking for medicinal plants and like that, your backyard is probably not big enough. And so oh wow! Yeah, but uh, okay. uh, the seed heads are just. Uh, also good bird food. Uh, about the time that the seed heads start uh, maturing, uh, the, uh, uh, the goldfinches are in their breeding plumage, they're brilliant, and it's just, it's really something to look in your yard and see them eating the heads of the uh, seed heads of the echinacea. I clipped this off, this is gonna have lateral blooms coming off. Okay. You can do fun things with uh, echinacea as far as pruning. Like if it's uh, blooming purple and you got something next to it you think looks terrible, <laughs> well, you can uh, clip it back um, uh, in middle of May and uh, it will delay the blooming and uh, it will, uh, and sometimes they'll even bloom more. It will encourage both lateral and basal growth on the oh, plant. Oh, neat, neat, okay. So uh, it, uh, it gives you different effects. Also, if you've got it, uh, like Baptiste, if you have it in full sun, it's gonna stand upright unless you have a wind or something. But if you do pruning at various points, you can give a, a sturdier plant that doesn't need staking. Okay, nice. Um, the uh, uh, last plant is uh, New England Aster. Uh, it, it's for fall bloom. Uh, uh, this one is for it. I don't know if they'll be able to see it on the camera, but it's just, uh, yeah, it just cool. happens to have a, a, a single flower. In the fall, these are covered in masses of flowers. Okay. Um, and uh, it's just really spectacular having the blue with the yellow centers. It also gives you a, a late season uh, food source for, for bees, monarch butterflies coming mm -hmm. through and mm -hmm. that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, just like the other plants, if it's in full sun, it doesn't need as much staking. Uh, but uh, during the year, and I typically cut this off, guess what, at July 4th, but I'll, <laughs> <Okay>. go, I'll, <laughs> I'll go back and, and clip back so uh, the, you know, the tops include uh, to, to make bushier, smaller plants. Okay. And this particular, particularly important if you get the wild, true uh, uh, New England aster because those are six foot uh, tall plants. Wow. So a lot of us uh, don't uh, necessarily want or have the room for six foot tall plants in your yard. And so you um, uh, buy named cultivars, you know, cultivated variety that have been bred for more profuse flowering and uh, uh, shorter stature. Uh, this particular cultivar, we call it Lichterman Mystery. Oh, and it's, uh, it's mystery. A, yeah, okay. actually, uh, about, about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, a volunteer gave us a start of this plant, and we, it, we, it, we know it's uh, New England Aster, uh, we know it's a cultivar, but we don't know, know which one, so we just call it the Lichterman Mystery. But uh, most reputable garden centers have named cultivars, and like I said, the big advantage of the name uh, cultivars is that they stay lower, okay. and th they're bred specifically for bright, intense colors and, um, and, and a low mounding habit. Wow. Uh, with the echinacea and the baptisia, we, the, they both reseed in your garden. If you save the seeds, you'll want to read online about uh, scarification. Yeah. You know, wildflowers, you know, like I said, just because you can grow them in your yard don't mean that uh, they want to. Sometimes it's harder than you think. Okay. But there's a couple of easy steps, like with echinacea, about storing them in wet sand in the refrigerator, these sort of things yeah, that you can that. read about online for both baptisia and echinacea if you collect the seeds to grow later. Uh, my technique is less formal. Uh, they, <laughs> particularly the echinacea has like a 200% germination rate. Not, not really, of course, but, <laughs> but, but every, every seed that the, that, the, that the birds don't eat seems to germinate. Oh, okay. And so you, uh, good, so with the baptisia and echinacea, I'm just about running out of friends to share them with. Wow, okay. Uh, but, so what I've done, I dig them up, we sell them in our annual plant yes, sale, yes. but uh, it, it, it's good if you like them, but, but if you, of course, if you cut these back before they uh, go to seed, that reduces the seed counts. Okay. The asters reproduce differently, particularly named cultivars. You know, named cultivars are crossbreeds of different types of plants. And so the seeds, although I don't think there's a particularly high germination rate for asters, but they may not come true from seed, but they grow through your garden. You gotta be prepared to kind of keep the aster in bounds after it fills out the space okay. you want it to, which is easily done, but you propagate the asters by root division. Root division. Yeah, you just basically okay. uh, look at a plant and you, you you cut off chunks that you want. You move them elsewhere. Sometimes in, in, in groups of plants, you have uh, the middle of it kind of uh, starts failing on you. And so you, it's really easy to rearrange their tough plants. I do recommend doing that work in spring. 
certainly well before 4th of July. Well before the 4th. Yeah, I was exactly. waiting for you to say that. Andy, we appreciate the information about wildflowers, and I can tell these are your favorites. Oh, they are. I have all, <laughs> uh, each, all these plants are in my yard uh, <laughs> blooming their heads off right now. All right. Well, thank you much. You can attract many different kinds of birds to your yard with a variety of feeders. Two of our feeders here today are seed and suet. With the type of habitat given here, you'll be likely to see maybe chickadees, tufted titmice, Carolina wrens. This feeder here has a platform for your blue jays or even your cardinals to stand on, or your woodpeckers would cling to the suet and peck out pieces of suet. They would be insect eaters in nature, but they'll come to your pole system or your feeders if you have suet available. I hope you'll set up a feeder system in your yard and enjoy many different species. All right, Andy, it's our Q&A session. You ready? Uh, sure am. All right, good questions and good images to go with the questions. I can't wait to see. All right, here we go with our first viewer email. I use safer soap on my pepper plants and now there are black spots on the leaves. What is it? And this is from Art in Eads. All right, Mr. Art. Phytotoxicity is what that is. Because you can see the uniform dead spots throughout the plant tissue, okay? He sprayed safer soap, soap residue. So if you have oh, high cool. temperatures, it can cause burning in the spots where you applied the product. There you have it. You know, so, of course, certain plants, you know, have, you know, sensitivity levels to, you know, certain chemicals, which is why you should yeah. always read the label. Well, if you uh, make a horrible mistake and apply that, uh, will it, can you wash it off in a certain amount of time uh, uh, that it will still kill what you're trying to kill, but, but get it off in time so it won't uh, have phytotoxicity of the leaves? You can do that but you're gonna to have to be timely with it. And a lot of water. Right, and a lot of water, Yeah, exactly. So it's best if you're gonna be spraying, you know, most of your plant material early morning, later yeah. on in the day, not during the heat of the day, because again, yeah. if you're using soaps, it's gonna leave that residue behind, high temperatures. Yeah. And what's the highest temperature you recommend applying a, a insecticidal soap? I usually tell folks I wouldn't spray any higher than 85 degrees. That, that makes sense to me. We, no higher than 85 degrees. We've had some dam damage in the in the greenhouse, so we you know overspray at the wrong time and all like that. Right. And, and now the prevention is worth a pound of cure. Oh yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I have plenty of experience with that. So trust me, <laughs> 85 <laughs> degrees, you don't want to go any higher than that because you will cause phytotoxicity mm -hmm. or you get some burning, you yep. know, which is what this is, plant injury. So there you have it, Mr. Art. Hope that helps you out. All right. So here's our next viewer email. I know you like this one. Okay. I have milkweed in my garden. Butterflies love it, but this year it is covered with this yellow stuff. What is this? And this is Susan in Shelbyville. Oh, let's do so, our up. Uh, how about that? Well, uh, uh, those are oleander aphids, uh -huh. and they're really, uh, they seem very prevalent this year. At the Nature Center, we have a lot of um, oleander aphids on milkweed, particularly the younger shoots and such. Okay. And, and they're terrible pests. I don't believe they're native to this country, but they're spread worldwide. Uh, the curator for Backyard Wildlife Center has milkweeds. She doesn't have that, but she knows she's got lots of ladybugs. Okay, you know, which is good. <clears throat> it's a good exactly. Thing. There are uh, uh, ladybugs, lacewing insects, and also there's some parasitic wasps that, that prey on the okay. aphids. But they reproduce like mad. Uh, <laughs> they actually clone themselves. They're, as far as I've been able to tell, there are no male uh, uh, aphids of this type in the wild. Uh, the females basically lay larvae, they, they clone themselves, mm -hmm. and they can uh, reproduce pretty wild, uh, wildly. <clears throat> uh, going back as far as rinsing with water, uh, one technique is you can kind of blast them off and that sort of right, stuff. I would recommend that. Um, this is not for the squeamish, but it's effective. But what I recommend personally uh -oh. with those is to put on some gloves. Uh -huh. they, have, uh, they excrete all sorts of nasty stuff. Uh, but just squish them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of satisfying. Try to get them early. <laughs> it's satisfying. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, yeah, for the for the people who are not squeamish. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, there are some products you can apply. I heard someone said Windex works and that sort of stuff. Ooh. You want to go chemical. But if you're trying to attract monarchs and other uh, insects, but uh, you can kill the eggs with the same sure. uh, chemicals sure. that treat uh, treat the aphids. Uh, you can also buy lace wings and uh, ladybugs uh, either uh, on the internet or sometimes local. Uh, uh, stores carry them and you just let them loose in your garden. You just got to realize once they uh, clean up, they, they'll go, they on go somewhere away. else. That's right. 
That's right. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I'm really cautious about uh, uh, if you're trying to attract uh, uh, butterflies right. using insecticides because you can kill not only the butterflies but their eggs and their larvae. Right, right. But the, the soaps are, you know, they're, they're, they're safe if you use them correctly according to the label. And there's some oils you can use. You yeah. just have to be careful with those. Yeah. But, yeah, I always tell folks, just pull out the water hose. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just knock them off. You'll be fine with that. All right, Andy. Okay. We out of time. Oh, thank well, you much. Well, appreciate you having me on. Right. Always a pleasure. All right, thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Want to learn more about beekeeping or wildflowers? Go to familyplotsgarden.com. You can rewatch those segments and find links to extension publications to learn more. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe.